Good morning, everybody. Hope you all had a wonderful weekend. Um, I'm delighted today to uh, be able to bring to you a guest speaker, uh, Professor Stephen Tarrant from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Steve's been kind enough to come and speak to this class before. Um, and re in return, I go down and speak to a large class that Steve teaches at Johns Hopkins. And it's always very interesting for me to do that. And I hope interesting for Steve to come and speak to you. He's a, a pioneer in the application of the law to public health. Um, as you can see from the slide there, he has training in the law, then uh, went back to school at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health to get his master's degree in public health. Um, he uh, has a very interesting background in legal experience, having worked as a civil rights attorney in New York City for some time, uh, practicing law in the state of New York, and then coming to the world of public health law through his connection with Johns Hopkins, and for many years he's been on the faculty at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. There he's a professor in the uh, Department of Health Policy and Management. He's also the director, as you can see, of the Center for Law and the Public's Health at Johns Hopkins University, a collaborative venture between Hopkins and Georgetown University, and has made a real mark in the world of public health through the application of the law. Um, I first got to know Steve at a meeting that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation put together on issues of diet, nutrition, and obesity, and they brought in people who had used the law um, in other areas, and Steve Terrett had made a real mark in the area of, of gun control and violence prevention, and uh, had a lot to say based on his experience there in the diet, nutrition, and obesity area, and um, ha has really had a phenomenal impact there, a national impact, has been involved in New York City's policies on gun control and violence and the like, and has more recently become interested in the area of diet, nutrition, and obesity, and has really been powerful, a powerful ally in that fight as well. Uh, so he's a remarkable person, creative, ingenious, uh, interesting in the way he applies the law to, to issues of public health, particularly the issues that we're talking about in this class, and I think you'll enjoy hearing from him. So let's please welcome Professor Stephen Terrett. Thank you very much, Kelly. If I'm so creative and genius, how come I do lecture 19? Okay. Uh, I guess one of the easiest ways to state the relationship between gun violence and uh, obesity would be to say, eat well or I'll kill you. But uh, that's not what uh, I wanted to talk about to you today. What I was hoping to uh, talk to you about is, in general, public health and public health strategy, public health policy, and how strategies and policies that have been shown to work in other areas of public health might, and, and that's a question that you should explore, uh, might work in trying to reduce the incidence of obesity worldwide or in the United States in particular. And I think that I'll probably focus more on uh, trying to address childhood obesity than obesity in general today. Um, so Kelly mentioned that I spent a, a portion <laughs> of my career in um, working on the area of gun violence prevention. And I'd like to use that as one of the examples, or perhaps the principal example about which I'll be talking with you today, trying to draw parallels. Uh, so let me start by telling you about an incident that happened some time ago here in New England, where uh, it was a Friday afternoon, and a young boy whose name is Ross, he was about 13, uh, was led out of school earlier than, than normal school, not just Ross, but everybody was let out, including Ross's friend, Stephen. And Ross and Stephen went to uh, Ross's house where they were just hanging out, playing, goofing off, and the, the phone rang and uh, Ross answered it, and it, it was his mother, and his mother, said to Ross, um, how are you doing? Uh, fine, he said, uh, I got out early. 
And she said, so what are you up to? And he said, I'm, uh, I'm just hanging out here with, with Stephen. Uh, we're playing. Ross's mother uh, said, you know, Ross, um, I've told you this before. I don't like being up here. Uh, I told you this before, but um, I don't like you being alone with Stephen. There's just something about this kid, Stephen, uh, Ross's friend, that Ross's mother didn't like. And Ross said to his mother, you're right, you're right, I'm sorry, uh, we'll leave. Uh, so they left Ross's house and um, they went to Stephen's house. I want to point out that um, Johns Hopkins actually has desks that we provide <laughs> students. <laughs> If any of you are thinking of graduate school, uh, <laughs> you might want to think of Hopkins. Uh, so, so they went to, uh, to Stephen's house, and um, Stephen says to Ross, come with me, I want to show you something. So uh, they went upstairs to the bedroom that Stephen's parents shared, and Stephen goes to his father's closet opens the door and reaches up to the, the shelf in which uh, Stephen's father has his sweaters or other things. And Stephen takes down a Beretta semi-automatic pistol. Now, I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, a pistol, what a pistol is, as opposed to a revolver. Do, do any of you not know uh, the difference between a pistol? And a revolver, okay. So uh, a revolver, if you watch old cowboy movies, a revolver is the thing that has uh, six bullets in it, and when the trigger is pulled, the cylinder revolves, hence the name. Uh, so it lines up the next bullet with, with the barrel of the gun. And a, a pistol is squarer in shape. A pistol. If you watch uh, movies on HBO, you'd see pistols instead of revolvers. A pistol is square in shape, and the, the bullets of a pistol are contained in something called the magazine, sometimes called the clip, and it fits into the butt of the gun, the back end of, uh, of the gun. So, uh, so Stephen takes down this, this Beretta, uh, Beretta is, a, is an old company. It's a company that's more than 500 years old, started in Italy, but they have a, uh, a Maryland uh, branch, Beretta USA, which actually is in my state, Maryland, in Acokeet, Maryland. And, and Beretta is a, a, a popular gun, popular pistol. So Stephen uh, pushes a button on the, uh, the side of the Beretta, and that button discharges the magazine. Remember that the magazine is what contains the bullet, and Stephen puts the magazine, the bullets, uh, back up. So he now has the, the, the handgun, the pistol, without the magazine in it. And he says to Ross, let's go out and play. So they're, uh, they're outside. They're in the, the driveway of Stephen's family's home and uh, horsing around. And at some point, Stephen uh, says uh, to Ross, he, he holds the gun like this. He, this. This is how people hold guns in movies now. And uh, Ross is bent down a little bit. And Stephen goes bang and pulls the trigger. But a bullet exits the gun. And the bullet entered Ross's face just to the left of Ross's nose and traveled in a slightly uh, downward path. So Ross is now uh, in the driveway, laying down in the driveway, exsanguinating. And uh, Stephen is going crazy. Uh, he, he runs into the house because he's going to call 911, but actually the first thing that he does is he runs upstairs, goes to the closet, and puts the gun back in the closet. And um, he calls 911. You can listen to the, the tape. He's, he's, he's sort of nuts. 
uh, in fear and says to the, the 911 operator that uh, his friend was just shot, that, that they were playing in the driveway and a shot came from the woods behind the house. He's scared, so he makes up a story. So uh, police come, uh, helicopter overhead, because uh, there's a sniper somewhere in the woods, and uh, ambulance comes, fire department comes, and uh, the police are talking to Stephen, and they realize that uh, this is a made up story, and Stephen quickly uh, tells them the truth what had happened, but he said that he, did, he didn't know that, that there was a bullet in the gun because he took the bullets out of the gun. Uh, and the ambulance takes Ross <coughs> to the local hospital. Ross's parents are contacted and they get there in time to sign the consent that allows the surgeons to harvest Ross's organs because Ross is brain dead and uh, they might as well do what they can for someone else, since there's nothing that they can do for their son anymore. So how, how do things like that happen? When, when you read about <coughs> things like that in the newspaper, uh, <coughs> it says, freak accident. Uh, but for people who work in public health, and how many people here are students in the School of Public Health, the Yale S School of Public Health? Okay. So uh, when you... Uh, work in public health, you become to, uh, become to understand that uh, these aren't freak accidents because there's a pattern to them. These boys were 13 years of age, the highest age uh, group, <coughs> highest risk age group for something like this happening is about 13 years of age, males, not females. Um, and the, the pattern <laughs> in public health is called the epidemiology of these events, there's a pattern as to what are the high risk guns, what are the high risk times of day, times of, of, of <coughs> year. And um, because there's this pattern, this epidemiology of these kinds of gun injuries and gun deaths, these gun injuries and gun deaths become to some extent foreseeable. It's not a freak accident in that this happens over and over again. When you work in the field of gun violence prevention, one of the sad things is you come into work in the morning and someone you don't know has sent you an email or some sent you um, a photocopy of a newspaper article with the same kind of story. Unfortunately, I'm in a position where I could tell you story after story after story of 13-year-old boys who were playing together and one of them got killed in, uh, by gunfire. Um, so you become the depository of these terribly sad stories and it's terribly sad on an individual basis but it's terribly sad on a population basis because I say that they're foreseeable and if they're foreseeable then it seems <coughs> that they also should be preventable. And what we as public health people try to do then is to come up with ideas about how would you prevent something like this from happening. What prevention strategy, there's a world of prevention out there, so what prevention strategy might work best so that the next foreseeable event of one 13-year-old boy shooting and killing another 13-year-old boy doesn't happen. So I know it's nine o'clock. Um, I know that many of you are undergraduates uh, and therefore non-functional at 9 a.m on a Monday morning, but let me ask you, just to see if you're responsive, uh, or whether we should sign a consent form for you. Uh, let me ask you, is, how would you go about preventing something like this? You don't want the next event like this to happen. What would you do? Do you think there's something that would work? Is there a strategy? Anybody have a suggestion? I can go ahead if you don't have suggestions. Yeah. Yes, please. Somehow making a training a permit for them um, somewhat differently structured if you have children. And when you have children, you have to go through some type of class. That That's a good have idea. To to so so if, if, you couldn't, if you couldn't hear, uh, was, it, was, was everybody able to hear that? Go ahead, we're repeated and focus on the camera. Okay, uh, the, the comment was 
we rarely see someone with a tie as attractive as the one that you have on. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's very kind of you. <laughs> but then your second comment, your second comment was, uh, why doesn't Kelly wear these ties? I don't know. <laughs> but your, your second comment was, um, if people are going to have a gun and they have children in the home, then maybe there should be some permit uh, for having a gun in the home that also has children and the permit could be tied to some kind of educational intervention where the, the people learn about what's, what's safe. Uh, okay, that's, that, uh, thank you, that's good. Anybody else have a suggestion? I won't make fun of you. Yeah. Yes? Not allowing guns to be stored at home entirely. Good, thank you very much. One more? Yes, please. Require the use of gun locks so that ammo be stored separately from and require and have ammo be stored separately uh, from the gun itself. Good, all, all, all good suggestions. But uh, not all suggestions are going to have equal effectiveness. I mean, that, that, that just stands to reason that not everything would be equally effective. So how do you figure out what's going to be the effective intervention? How do you figure out what's going to be the effective intervention for preventing childhood gun-related deaths or preventing childhood obesity? Uh, we, we need to come up with ideas or, or models. So um, let me present to you, or let me ask you, if you will, to, um, to engage in a fiction with me for a minute about guns. Think of a gun, an individual gun, as having a, a life uh, span. And think of that lifespan as having certain markers in it. So uh, the beginning of the lifespan of the gun would be the manufacture of the gun. That's the birth of the gun. It's created, the manufacture and the design uh, of the gun by which it's manufactured. Then the next marker in this fictional lifespan of the gun would be um, when the gun is, is sold or the purchase of the gun. And then the next <laughs> marker in the lifespan, so, so think of there being a, a timeline here and at the beginning of the timeline is the birth or manufacture of the gun, then there's the sale of the gun. The next marker in this fictional lifespan of the gun is the possession of the gun or the carrying of the gun and then let's have as the, uh, the last marker in this fictional lifespan of the gun, the use of the gun or the pulling of the trigger. You could have policy that addresses these different markers in the lifespan of the gun. You could have policy that addresses the use of the gun, the last one, saying thou shalt not uh, point a gun at somebody and, and, and pull the trigger. We do have policy, we have a lot of policy in the United States. There are federal laws, there are state laws in every one of our states, there are local laws about uh, shooting. You could also have policy in, in each one of the other markers of the lifespan of the gun. But those policies may not be equally effective, as I was mentioning to you before. So what I would like to um, suggest to you is that if you thought about the lifespan of the gun with, with these uh, markers, and you had effectiveness with high effectiveness and low effectiveness, if you plotted out the likelihood of, uh, of effectiveness, my suggestion to you is that the effectiveness would be much higher at the early part of the lifespan of the gun than it would be down here at the use of the gun. So down here, we've already manufactured millions of guns. In the United States, we manufacture about three million new handguns every year, put them into the stream of commerce. So again, down, down here at possession and, and use, We've already manufactured the gun. We've already figured out, or someone has figured out what they want to do about the uh, design of the gun. The person is already carrying the gun or possessing the gun. And what we would say in terms of, uh, of policy 
for the use of the gun is you know the gun that you have in your hand or the gun that you have in your pocket, we always want you to act kindly and prudently with that gun. Even though sometimes you may be filled with alcohol or other drugs, sometimes you may be filled with rage, sometimes you may be filled with rage for very good reasons because we live in an unfair world and there are things that do engender rage in an unfair world, but when you are filled with rage and with alcohol or something else, we want you, when you have this gun on you, we want you not to use the gun in a violent way against someone else. That's foolish in my mind. If you really want success, if you want effectiveness, defining effectiveness as reducing the incidence of gun violence in the United States, then you need to shift your focus back. We can have laws about possession. Most of our laws in the United States about possession have been making it easier to possess a gun, concealed carry laws that many states have passed. We can have laws about sale. We do have laws about sale. I don't know if any of you have gone and bought a gun. Uh, some of you are too young to buy a handgun under federal law. But uh, we, we have laws about uh, sale or purchase of guns. Until recent times, the law about sale of gun is the person who wants to go in and buy a gun. And, and I just got contacted by a lawyer <coughs> recently who's representing a man who's a quadriplegic because a, uh, an 18 year old person went into a, uh, a pawn shop bought a gun. Uh, the gun was illegally sold to the 18-year-old person, and the 18-year-old person then went to a shopping center, and with that gun and one other gun, shot up the, shop the shopping center in Salt Lake City, Utah, killing a number of people and severely wounding others. Uh, so there's a, a lawsuit against the pawn shop for violating the, the laws or the policy with regarding the sale of a gun. But what we've relied upon with regard to policy for the sale of a gun is a person like this 18-year-old who went into the pawn shop. A person comes into a place that sells guns, looks in the, the display case uh, of, a gun, uh, of guns, and says to the clerk, I'd like that one. So the clerk has a, a pad uh, and tears off the, the top uh, page of uh, form 4473 of the Bureau of Alcohol, <coughs> Tobacco, and Firearms. Now it's called Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Uh, and asks the, the intended purchaser to please fill out form 4473. The person looks at form <coughs> 4473 and it says, hey, uh, are you a fugitive from justice? person thinks, and uh, no, I don't, no, I don't recall that, uh, checks no. Uh, it says, um, are you a convicted felon? Uh, no. Um, have you been adjudicated mentally incompetent? Uh, how many people are, are going to go, oh, God, thank you for reminding me. I remember <laughs> the adjudication. Now, yes, you ought not to sell me the gun. I have a, a friend, <coughs> uh, Park Dietz, who's a forensic psychiatrist to the stars in Los Angeles, uh, who before he, he did that was a professor at University of Virginia, and he went to the Virginia Hospital for the Criminally Insane, or some uh, name like that, where everyone, by definition, had been adjudicated mentally incompetent, and he passed out a questionnaire <laughs> saying to each person, have you been adjudicated mentally incompetent? 75% of the people said no. I mean, they're mentally incompetent. Why would they say yes? Uh, but we relied upon self-reporting as our policy for trying to keep guns out of the hands of people who we thought were um, disproportionately dangerous. But instead, we can look at the manufacture of the gun and the design of a gun and make decisions as a public about whether we want three million new handguns made every year in the United States. And if we do want three million uh, new handguns made every year in the United States, how do we want those guns to be designed? There are certain things on guns called magazine disconnect devices and loaded chamber indicators that might have prevented this kind of tragedy from happening to uh, this boy, Ross. A, mag a loaded chamber indicator 
is a kind of thing on the gun that tells you whether there's a bullet in a gun. So what happened with Stephen's father's gun is Stephen took out the clip, but there was this thing called the round in the chamber. There was still a bullet contained in the gun that wasn't in the clip or the magazine that Stephen took out. <coughs> and that situation so frequently results in injury or death to others because people didn't know there was a round in the chamber. But you can have a device on a gun that's called a loaded chamber indicator, a little piece of metal that sticks out, or it could be more sophisticated, like a red light that comes on, that tells you that there's a bullet in the gun. Would you buy a camera that didn't tell you whether there was film in the camera? Would you buy a car that wouldn't tell you whether you had gas in your gas tank? I don't think so. But every day, people buy guns that don't tell them that there's a round in the chamber, a bullet in the gun, even though the device that would tell you is something that was patented more than a century ago and would cost less than a dollar to put on guns. And some guns have it, so it's eminently technological fe technologically feasible. Or there's something called a magazine disconnect device, where if you take out the magazine, as Stephen did, even though there's still a round in the chamber, without the magazine in the gun, the gun the, you can't pull the trigger and discharge the bullet. So Ross would not have been killed had this gun had a magazine disconnect device on it. And again, the patent for magazine disconnect device is more than a century old and the cost is less than a dollar again, and it exists on a very small percentage of guns, but it's technologically feasible. It doesn't exist on most handguns, and it doesn't exist on most handguns because we don't regulate them as to their design. We don't look all the way back here at the point of manufacture for formulating our policy, even though that would be the most effective kind of policy. So what, if anything, uh, does this teach you about food? I'm not sure that I know the answer. Uh, and I won't know the answer to a lot of the, the comparisons here between firearms and food, because I'm not as smart about food policy as Dr. Brownell is, or, or many of the uh, other people who will come lecture you in this course. But it seems to me that if we say, let's regulate eating, if you think of there being a lifespan with regard to food, being the manufacturer, the growing, or the processing of the food, the marketing of the food, the purchase of the food, the eating of the food, if we put our policy investment down here at the end of the lifespan of the food for eating. So you can walk into the supermarket, you can walk into the convenience store, you can buy whatever garbage you want, no matter how obesogenic the food is, but we're saying to the people once they've done that, but please be careful about eating the food. That just doesn't make sense to me. We can try to regulate the purchase of the food, but it may be that that too is of relatively low yield in effectiveness. Marketing may buy you some more. We market food to kids. I don't know if you've already had lectures on marketing of food uh, to kids, but that seems like something that's uh, eminently well regulated or could be, isn't well regulated now, but could be well regulated. There are people like Jennifer Pomerantz. Have you met Jennifer Pomerantz? Jennifer Pomerantz is raising her hand now. And Jennifer Pomerantz is the director of legal studies and in legal initiatives at the Rudd Center. And Jennifer works on, among other uh, issues, she works on the area of marketing of food to children as a, a, a means of reducing the risk of childhood obesity. And you can look also at the manufacture, the processing of food about how much high fructose corn syrup is going to go into food unnecessarily, perhaps how much salt is going to be in the food, which may be only indirectly related to obesity, but salt is said to kill 150,000 people in the United States unnecessarily from 
the kinds of hypertensive diseases and renal diseases that come from eating too much salt that doesn't have to be in food. So we, we need to think about how do we want to uh, invest our regulatory efforts and our legal efforts with regard to food <coughs> policy. And one way of doing that might be this type of thing, uh, similarly to uh, how I uh, discussed about this with guns. With the public health principle here being, it's better to provide the population with some kind of automatic protection where they don't have to do something. They don't have to make a decision every time they want to put something in their mouth, every time they get into a car, they don't have to make the decision about how they're going to give themselves safety. We put airbags in cars, which are automatic protection. We want people to buckle up also. But we put airbags in cars, I may talk about that a little more in a couple minutes, because we want them to be automatically protected where they don't have to do something to avail themselves of the benefit of the airbag. We want to do something automatically for people which is best done at the time of manufacture so that they don't always have to be considering what should they be doing when they're making decisions about what to eat and how much to eat and what are the contents of the things that they're eating, particularly if they're in a restaurant and they don't know what the content of the uh, things is that they're eating. I want to talk to you about uh, another public health model uh, that deals again with guns, but I think is applicable to, uh, to other issues. So think of the universe of people. Y you remember Venn diagrams when you were in uh, high school, you learned about Venn diagrams. Is there anybody who didn't learn about Venn diagrams? Should we explain Venn diagrams to somebody? When I was in high school, I had a great math teacher he was a great math teacher, but notwithstanding uh, his greatness, I was a uniquely poor math student. But one of the few things that I do, we met, lawyers don't have to be good math students. All lawyers have to know how to do is divide by three because your contingent fee is one third of what you get for your client. <laughs> and, and, and so we're, we're genetically, we, uh, we're very good at dividing by three, but we don't do other quantitative things uh, quite as well. But this math teacher uh, taught us about, um, he said, think of the Triborough Bridge. You're going over the Triborough Bridge, which is in New York City, if you're not from there, and there's a, a, a big sign that says, um, Bronx, uh, two right lanes, Manhattan, uh, three left lanes, but there are only four lanes. Uh, this is a Venn diagram. You, you, uh, <laughs> so, um, so think of uh, the beginning of a Venn diagram as being the universe of people. People, <coughs> some of whom may want to have guns. Uh, and maybe from a policy point of view, it's okay for some of these people to have guns, but maybe it's not okay for some people to have guns. And then think of I, I once was debating somebody uh, about guns, and, and this man was, was saying um, that all we have to do to reduce the incidence of gun deaths, this, this was at an American Academy of Pediatrics meeting, and this was uh, a famous yet perverse pediatrician. Uh, and uh, what he was saying is all we have to do to reduce the incidence of gun deaths is teach people the safety rules about uh, guns. And he would say, and as you can see on my next slide, this is before there were PowerPoints, there were slides and there were remote control things, but he would turn, he would turn it and point it at the screen instead of at the slide projector, which uh, here's a man who's saying all we have to do is teach people the <coughs> basics about gun safety and he's pointing his gun in the wrong, <laughs> Direction. Okay. Uh, so let me point my gun in the right direction here. So you also have a universe of guns, and it may be that there are some guns which it's okay for people to have, and some guns for which it's not okay uh, for people 
to have. So the key area becomes this area, the overlap in the Venn diagram, this, this area, which were shaded, I could say the shaded area uh, <laughs> being, being uh, the people, certain people, who are allowed to have certain guns. But then there are some people, the felons, the adjudicated mentally incompetent, the fugitives from justice, etc. There are some people who should have no guns, and there are some guns, 50 caliber guns, for example, that no people should have. So the point of view with regard to, uh, why not, to gun policy, did those just move, uh, is that what we want to do is we want to move those circles away from each other so that we're minimizing this non-shaded shaded area uh, so that there are more people who are in the proscribed category, <coughs> like maybe it's not only felons, but maybe it's people who were convicted of a violent act that would have been a felony, but the courts were too crowded, so it was reduced to a misdemeanor, so they're misdemeanants rather than felons, but maybe they shouldn't be allowed to have a gun. Or maybe there are more guns, like Saturday night specials, the cheap handguns that are sort of like the starter guns for someone launching his uh, criminal career that no one should be allowed to have. So a, as a, a policy uh, means, what we want to do is move those circles uh, away from each other so we're, we're narrowing that, that area. What if instead we had nutrition circles? So again, you have people and uh, here you have foods, different kinds of foods. So in the people category, you have uh, adults, you have kids, you have uh, people who have a predilection for obesity. In the food categories, you have good foods, you have unhealthy foods, you have foods that are obesogenic, foods that are high in sugars, foods that are high in salt. You also have places, uh, places being things like schools, um, well, why don't we just leave it at schools if we're dealing with uh, children. And if you look at what the policy is about food, it's essentially that anyone can eat any food in any place. We don't have policies with regard to foods that regulate who should be eating what and what places. But again, we could change that. We could move the places uh, circle down so that, for instance, in schools, there are some foods that you can eat, but there are some foods that you ought not to be able to eat. Move the foods circle out, move the people out, so that ultimately this uh, area over here uh, is, doesn't have to be minimized, but we want to make sure that uh, some people who shouldn't be eating certain foods in certain places like schools are not uh, doing so, let me talk to you about one more area of um, conceptual models. I want to talk to you about something called the Haddon Matrix. Bill Haddon uh, was a genius of a, a man. He's now deceased. He's, he was a physician. He was trained in public health. He went to, um, to college, to a school. I can't remember, what's the school that begins with an H? <laughs> um, he went to where Jennifer went, he went to Harvard, um, and he went to MIT. Uh, he was a health officer in, in New York State, county health officer in Westchester County, and he became the first administrator of what's now called the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which is the federal government agency that controls uh, the design of vehicles and, and a number of other things to try to reduce the 42,000 deaths that occur on the highways in the United States every year. So Bill Haddon, who's also the father of the field of injury prevention, said, if we're thinking of ways to address a problem, why don't we uh, think of there being certain factors the factors, did I just change it? No. The factors uh, being over here 
that are pre-event, event, and post-event. I'll explain those to you in a second. And let's also, I'm sorry, the factors being here, human, vehicle, physical environment, social, legal environment, and the phases being pre-event, event, and post-event. Now, wh what Hadden meant by this is uh, for the phases. If you think of injuries occurring during motor vehicle crashes, and he created this matrix principally for motor vehicle crashes, but then realized that it was widely applicable to other public health problems, the event would be the actual crash of the car. But there are things that can be done that reduce the likelihood of, of an injury before the car crashes and after the car crashes, as well as at the time the car crashes. And those things can deal with humans who are involved in this. They can deal with the vehicle, that would be the car in this case, or they can deal with the physical environment or the social, cultural, and legal environment. And the reason, one of the reasons that Haddon came up with this matrix is because most interventions, the knee-jerk reaction to interventions are interventions that occupy this cell, the pre-event human cell. And the pre-event human cell is characterized by educational interventions. Now, I don't want to badmouth educational interventions too much uh, because sometimes they might work. Somewhere there might have been an educational intervention that worked. I recognize that I'm basically in a psychology class, so I don't want to say that educational interventions never work. I'm an educator. I don't want to say that educational interventions never work. But we would be misplacing our policy capital if we only looked to that one cell of a multi-celled matrix. I'm sure you each have your own personal stories that you could tell. Uh, let me tell you one, one of mine. I, um, Kelly said I used to be a, a lawyer. I was a plaintiff's trial lawyer in New York State, and I decided that I wanted to go to public health school and work in the field of injury prevention. So I went to Johns Hopkins School of Public Health the largest, the oldest, the number one rated uh, school of, of public health, in case any of you were thinking of postgraduate or graduate work. Um, a school of public health where, I don't know if I said this before, but where we actually have desks for students. Um, so I, I, went, I went to the school of public health and I sat at the feet of the goddess of injury prevention, a woman named Susan Baker. And, uh, and I was learning everything about injury prevention. I was living in uh, a row house. This is what in other areas that are not Baltimore would be called townhomes. But in Baltimore, they're, they're still called row houses, which are connected single family houses that are all connected. So you have a wall that separates you from the adjoining uh, row house housing a different family. So uh, one, one day I was downstairs uh, in the basement with my son Michael, who uh, must have been uh, six or seven years old, and my wife and, uh, and my daughter were out away from the house, and my then youngest child, Christopher, was upstairs in his crib taking his nap, and um, I was playing with uh, Legos. I don't know if people know what Legos are anymore. Uh, yeah, you know what Legos are? So we're playing with Legos, these little building blocks that you put together, and I, I go, Michael, do you smell something burning? And uh, Michael, no, no. Um, so I said, um, I'm gonna go upstairs and, and check. Uh, you stay here. So I run upstairs, uh, nothing on the first floor, I run up one more floor where Christopher is taking his nap, don't smell anything, okay, I made a mistake. I come back down to the basement and there's a, a crack in the wall that separates our row house from the other row house and I see black smoke coming through the crack. And I say, Michael, there's a fire next door. Michael, you, you go outside and don't cross the street or anything but walk to the end of the block and just stand there on the corner I'm going to go get Christopher. I'll meet you there in, in less than a, a minute. So uh, he does that. 
I go upstairs, I grab tiny baby Christopher, uh, run out, who, who's, who's now almost 30, uh, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and run out of the house with tiny baby Christopher. Uh, and I see the house next door now is engulfed in flames that have broken the windows and, and the flames are lapping up on the, the outside of the house. And now everyone in the whole community has gathered because you could smell it, you could hear it, uh, that, that a row house is burning, it's frightening. So uh, I get to the corner, there are a bunch of people there and I say uh, to a neighbor, you, you take Christopher here, I've got to go back in to get the valuables. Oh, God, well, how stupid. Uh, I'm an injury control student. I, I, I know this kind of stuff. You never enter a burning building or a smoky building. I give Christopher to a neighbor. I go back in. The, the house now is filled with black sooty smoke. It's, it, it's clawing at, at your throat. I, I make my way in the darkness. It's the middle of the day, but, but the house is filled with black smoke. I grope my way upstairs uh, to the bedroom to get the valuables. And it was at that point that I realized that I'm a graduate student and by definition, therefore, I have no valuables. <laughs> I mean, what, what am I going to get? There is nothing there. But I also recognize that the street is filled now with scores of, of neighbors. I'm not gonna come out empty handed and look <laughs> stupid in front of the neighbors. So um, I grab the toothbrushes and I come out, <laughs> I got the toothbrushes. So I mean, what a dumb thing to do. You, you don't do that. I'm supposed to be an expert or a budding expert in injury control. I have learned, I've been the subject of educational interventions that tell me that you don't enter a building, but people aren't always smart. So if you invest all of your effort in, in this cell of educating humans to always act prudently, you're going to miss a whole lot of other opportunities that, uh, that you shouldn't miss. So with regard to going back to Ross and Stephen and, and guns, with regard to what can you do to prevent these kinds of things from happening, you can have educational programs. Have them if you want, but I don't know how much you're going to get out of them. You could have humans wear bulletproof vests. Uh, you could have humans have uh, physical resilience. So if they're in a car crash, if they get shot, if they're healthy and strong, then maybe they're not going to die from that kind of injury. You could change the vehicle, in this case the vehicle being a gun by having loaded chamber indicators, which before the event, before the trigger is pulled, would tell you that there's a bullet in the gun. You could have these magazine disconnect devices that I mentioned to you, so the trigger is pulled, the event occurs, but a bullet doesn't come out of the gun. I'm not going to go over all these other things. You could change the uh, environment, the physical environment, have gun safes, uh, this was not meant to be a safe gun, but a gun safe in the home so that people store their guns, uh, change the physical environment of how they store the guns. You could have emergency medical services with easy access, changing the environment so people have easy access to emergency medical services. You can, in the uh, social and legal environment, you can have trauma systems, which would be a post-event strategy you could legally ban guns were it not for a recent decision by the United States Supreme Court, uh, which would be a pre-event strategy. Uh, I don't think I'm going to take the time to discuss what that means, but there are things that can be uh, done. If you, if you think about what does the Haddon Matrix offer you, it's a tool for thinking about uh, prevention it shows you that you don't have to focus solely on that one human pre-event cell for your interventions. You should expand your mind and think about uh, other things. And you don't have to fill in every single cell when you're trying to do a head and matrix, nor do you really have to worry. One, one of the ways that the head and matrix gets uh, ruined in, in discussions 
is people will have endless Talmudic debate over which cell does a particular intervention or proposed intervention belong in. Who cares? The purpose of the Haddon matrix is to allow you to think through all kinds of interventions, and it doesn't really matter if, if Kelly says it goes in one cell, I say it goes in another cell. What matters is that we thought of the uh, intervention. So you could think of uh, trying to make a, uh, a Haddon matrix with the event not being a car crash or the event not being the pulling of a trigger, but the event being excessive caloric intake. And, um, and you could think of how would you fill this in? And we, we won't have uh, time or opportunity in, in our short time today about how you would fill it in. But there, there are things that you could do. And again, this, the purpose of doing this is to give you an opportunity to ex expand your fields of interest. So for the, and, and, and the other thing about the Haddon matrix is you're allowed to say stupid things uh, and, and then just say, all right, but we would never do that. So for the human factor, uh, you could educate people in the pre-event phase, you could have bariatric surgery that makes your stomach much smaller so you can only eat a little bit during the uh, event phase. Bulimia, uh, you ought not to do that. That's a very, very bad idea. Uh, but that would be a post-eating uh, event way of not, uh, not having so much um, obesity. But again, let me stress, this is a very bad idea. Uh, with regard to the vehicle or vector, those are epidemiologic terms. In this case, it would be the food that you're talking about. Food is the vehicle or the vector. Vector is a living thing. Uh, sometimes we eat living things. Sometimes some people eat living things. Um, so in the pre-event uh, phase, you could have food that's uh, low in calories. You could have smaller portions during the event phase. All of these uh, slides will be made available to you, so you don't need to copy this down. Uh, and again, it, I want to stress that you don't have to fill in every single cell. It's OK. You, you may have ideas for what goes in the cells. When I was trying to make these slides, I didn't have such good ideas. With regard to the physical environment, you can have something that allows for stores to exist in inner city areas that sell healthy foods rather than foods that are unhealthy. You could have menu labeling, uh, change the physical environment. So you walk into a fast food store and there's, menu there's a sign that tells you uh, how much calories are in the item that you're considering ordering. Or you can change the social or the legal environment uh, and uh, as, a, as a law, you could eliminate the uh, subsidy for corn, which would result in uh, perhaps less use of high fructose corn syrup and perhaps uh, less calorie dense foods. As a result, you could regulate the sale of foods, something that we, we don't think about a whole lot, but should children be allowed to buy any food they want? Should a, should a young child be allowed to go into a, a convenience store and buy a, a majorly large bag of potato chips or a soft drink containing a lot of sugar. And you could also, as a post-event uh, legal intervention, you could engage in, in litigation, uh, not only litigation suing McDonald's, et cetera, for uh, making people fat, but engage in litigations for uh, litigation for other things that maybe you'll discuss in this course, like the, the, the possibility that some food manufacturers may be actually trying to uh, make their food have an addictive quality. So the, the point with regard to the Haddon matrix is uh, don't allow yourself to take a myopic view of policy uh, by only focusing on that human pre-event educational intervention cell, you should look at um, you should look at a lot of different kinds of policies. My school of public health uh, is called the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health because a man named Bloomberg, who's the mayor of New York City, uh, happened to give enough hundreds of millions of dollars to then find his name on the side of the building. Uh, for which we're very, very grateful. 
but Mike Bloomberg, uh, when he was a student at Johns Hopkins, was very much influenced by an article that was published. He was interested in business back then, even though he was an engineering student. There was an article that was published in the early 60s in the Harvard uh, Business Journal called Marketing Myopia. It was written by a man named Theodore Levitt. And what Levitt said in, in this article, which is a classic, and, and Theodore Levitt unfortunately just passed away a few months ago, uh, what Theodore Levitt wrote was that sometimes companies do poorly because they're myopic. He gave as an example the, the train uh, industry, railroad industry. At one time, the railroad industry was considered uh, the very best investment uh, that, that anyone could make. There were, there were uh, rulers of countries outside of the United States who would invest in the United States railroad industry, but the railroad industry has, has not done well, as is the case with many other industries. And um, Levitt's argument was because the railroad industry was myopic. The railroad industry thought that it was in the business of trains. When Levitt suggests it was in the business of transportation. And if it realized that it was in the business of transportation, the railroad industry could have become also the automotive industry, the airline industry, parenthetically, neither one of those are doing too well uh, right now, but they were when Levitt wrote this article. So, so I, he was saying, don't be myopic about what your business is about. Our business in public health is about saving lives millions at a time, and we shouldn't be myopic about what our opportunities are with regard to prevention policy. They're far more than just trying to uh, tell people to always act prudently when they're making decisions that will affect their, public's, the, their, the, their health and the public's health. I want to go through now um, quickly <coughs> 10 questions uh, that I would like to suggest to you for um, considering when you're selecting policies to protect the well-being of populations. The first question, and again, you'll get these questions uh, on, on the slide, so you don't need to uh, write this down. But the first question is to identify what's the public health goal that you're seeking to achieve. And, and you need to keep that public health goal in mind. So I think that what we're talking about, other than the guns and the other examples I've given you, is that we're talking about reducing the incidence and the severity of, uh, of childhood obesity. And it's important to keep your public health goal in mind because you can get pulled away into political goals or other types of goals that may not lead you to the same place as your public health goal uh, in mind. It's also to keep in mind that if, if we are public health people, and I know that many of you are not yet public health people, but when you come to Johns Hopkins that actually has desks for students, uh, you will become public health people. Um, public health people have public health in mind. Not everyone else has public health in mind. So when we come up with public health interventions, policy interventions, they may be interventions that other people don't like. So we say, for example, there ought to be a law that requires motorcyclists to wear helmets when they ride on their motorcycles on the highway. We do that because we don't like the idea of traumatic brain injury. But motorcyclists like feeling the wind through their hair, and uh, they may have uh, an interest that's higher in my, their mind that the pleasure of feeling the wind through their hair than what we think of as the, uh, the foremost interest, which is a public health interest. So we should keep that in mind uh, to remain um, adequately humble about what we want to do. The second question is if, if you've uh, addressed your uh, public health goal, then what policy objective, if any, will help you achieve that public health goal? And again, as I've said to you already, not all policy objectives are going to be equally effective. So you could have as your policy objective educating the person who feeds the child if you want to, as your, your, uh, your public health goal, you want to reduce the incidence and severity of childhood obesity. You could regulate marketing to children. You could regulate the caloric density of the food 
and you, you need to think again uh, through this process of um, what best allows you to achieve your public health goal because uh, there'll be differences. I'm not sure if that's a question or a stretch. It was a stretch, okay. Um, the third of these, uh, these th three uh, questions uh, would be by what tool is that policy that you've chosen best created? There are different tools. There's, there's legislation, there's regulation, there's litigation, there are tools that deal with collaborative voluntary efforts. I think you already had Dr. Derek Yak uh, talk with you about things that maybe collaboratively people could do with industry to try to uh, reduce how calorie dense foods are, their programmatic efforts, but you should think through these different tools and it's not that you have to devote yourself to only one tool. These are not mutually exclusive categories. You could be doing legislation at the same time you're doing regulation, <coughs> at the same time you're doing uh, litigation. I mentioned earlier that maybe I would take just a minute and, and say something about airbags uh, and cars to you, so, so let me do that uh, here. When I first came to the field of public health and injury control, motor vehicle related injuries were the worst problem. There, there were 52,000 deaths a year in the United States rather than the present 42,000 that we have now and, and we <laughs> wanted to reduce the incidence of motor vehicle deaths and one way of doing that, people were convinced, correctly so, would be to get airbags in cars. So we tried to get airbags in cars by having Congress mandate it. Politically, that was very difficult to do. We tried getting airbags in cars by having the regulatory agency, the one that I mentioned earlier, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, make a regulation requiring airbags in cars. That too was very politically difficult to do. So we turned to a third tool, we turned to litigation. There was an article that was published in a magazine called Trial Magazine, the magazine of what was then called the Association of Trial Lawyers of America, an organization of about 60,000 plaintiffs trial lawyers. These are the lawyers bringing lawsuits. And the article said to these 60,000 plaintiff trial lawyers, when you have a client come into your office, a client who has been in a car crash, a client who has suffered uh, paralysis as a result of that, or uh, who has brain damage, or <coughs> who has facially disfiguring scarring as a result of a frontal collision. Don't think only of suing the driver of the other car, but think about suing the car manufacturer for failing to offer an airbag in cars because for decades, the car manufacturers knew and proved that airbags would be extremely effective in reducing the incidence of morbidity and mortality that results from frontal or frontal oblique uh, car crashes. So as a result of that, that article, a lawyer in Birmingham, Alabama, had a client whose name was Rebecca Burgess. Rebecca Burgess was 18 years of age. She just graduated high school. She'd been a cheerleader. Uh, she was going on for some additional education. She was driving a, a Ford and she was in a frontal collision. And if you look at pictures of Miss Burgess before the crash and after the crash, you couldn't recognize them as being the same person in the crash she was rendered a uh, brain damaged spastic quadriplegic. Uh, and the, the lawsuit was brought against Ford saying you should have put an airbag in the car. 10 days into the trial, the lawsuit was settled by the payment of Ford of $1.8 million to Ms. Burgess. I, I told you before that lawyers are good at dividing by three. One point eight million divided by three is some large number. Um, <laughs> told you that I'm not good at uh, math. Uh, so lawyers know that's a hefty fee. So as a result of that and the publicity, uh, there was publicity among lawyers, there was publicity 
among the public. I got to go on the Today Show because I was the person who wrote the article in Trial Magazine and, and talk about this kind of thing. As a result of all of that, there was a tidal wave of litigation, so much so that at the end of 1985, when Ford Motor Company had to file its forms with the Securities and Exchange Commission, as corporations do, it said to the Securities and Exchange Commission that for that year, 1985, it had pending against it in airbag litigation claims the amount of $1.1 billion, billion dollars. That, coincidentally or not, was also the year that Ford decided to offer airbags as an option in cars. So litigation can be a potent tool in protecting the health of the public, whether you're talking about cars, whether you're talking about guns, or actually whether you're talking about food. And one of the things that the uh, Rudd Center is making a real mark on is understanding how litigation can be used as an effective tool in uh, reducing the incidence of obesity, particularly among children. The next question is you need to know what the major barriers are to achieving uh, your policy objective. There are going to be barriers that deal with legality. There are going to be barriers that deal with cost. There are going to be barriers that deal with personal freedoms. There are going to be barriers about bad science. I said to you uh, that one of the things public health people tried to do was to uh, get legislatures uh, at the state level to pass laws requiring motorcyclists to wear helmets. I used to go to a lot of motorcycle helmet uh, hearings in legislative committees. My f they're, they're great theater. My, my favorite thing was listening to a motorcyclist uh, testifying once saying that um, you don't want motorcyclists to have to wear helmets because they interfere with peripheral vision. And he said that what he, as a safe motorcyclist, does whenever he's riding down the highway is he has one eye looking straight ahead at the roadway and the other scanning <laughs> uh, the, the periphery, perhaps some kind of lizard life uh, <laughs> capable of doing that. But you look at the legislators who are listening to this and they go, ah, yes, uh, yeah, sure, you would want to do that. So um, bad science is one of the issues that you sometimes have to deal with as a barrier to achieving your policy. Uh, you need to learn how you can overcome those barriers. One way is by appealing to children. It's always easier to get policy made if you're dealing with children than if you're dealing with adults because everybody wants to protect children. You can have exemptions to policy so that your most stringent critics are exempted from it. This happens with things like um, vaccine policy where you leave a little loophole in mandatory childhood immunization laws saying you don't have to have your child vaccinated if it violates your religious beliefs or your philosophical beliefs. So sometimes these exemptions are useful. You will be relying upon the police powers of the states. Those are the powers reserved by the United States Constitution to the states uh, to protect the well-being of the public and you can try to rebut bad science with good science. The uh, next question is that of, is there adequate science to support your uh, policy objective? Sometimes the decision makers, legislators, don't care about whether there's adequate science, like with the uh, lizard life being able to look in all directions. Uh, sometimes you can act in the absence of science, sometimes you can simultaneously to advocating for policy create the science, do small studies, do studies that are very scientifically relevant as the Rudd Center is committed to doing and sometimes even the science can come afterwards uh, after the policy has been made. A very difficult issue is how do you deal with opposition from within your field? Uh, that's tough to deal with, but it always comes up, whether you're talking about 
environmental policy, whether you're talking about public health, whether you're talking about anything. We, fortunately for academics, we live in a field of great freedom where we're all allowed to voice our opinions and we like to disagree with each other. So you frequently will have opposition from within your field. You can compromise uh, when necessary. You can try to achieve <laughs> consensus. If that doesn't work, you have to have the uh, courage of your own convictions in, in the field of trying to protect children from obesity. We have an example of that um, happening right now with regard to a difficult legal issue uh, called preemption, where part of the, the, the public health community says, we don't care if the federal government preempts states from making more stringent laws. Other people within the public health community say, we do care about that and you have to try to figure out a way to either resolve that or go ahead with the courage of your own convictions. Not only will you have opposition from within the field, but you'll have oppositions that's external to your field that you can expect, uh, compromise when necessary, just be smarter, work harder, be willing to play hardball. And uh, there's a uh, quotation from Goethe that I like which says, be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. Uh, so uh, rely on the fact that if you're bold about pursuing in a strong way your policy objectives, sometimes you'll be lucky and some mighty forces may come to your aid like um, what happened uh, last Tuesday. Uh, you also, uh, need to be able to assure that you'll have proper implementation of your policy. I if implementation goes awry, then everything that you were trying to do will go awry. It's not enough to put the policy in place, but the implementation of the policy is uh, of, of great matter. And lastly, you need to uh, remember that you're going to have to evaluate your policy, uh, you should plan on that from the beginning. You should have unbiased evaluators. You should evaluate both process and outcome and you can learn about those uh, when you come to Hopkins. And um, based on your evaluation, you also should ultimately revise your initial strategies or your initial policies. So here you have uh, you have a number of different ways of thinking about, as public health people tend to do, of thinking about how do I formulate policies, how do I choose among competing policies, how do I get uh, policy put in place and implemented properly. And we need to think about these things. We need to think about these things because we have so many problems. We don't only have the problem of childhood obesity, we have a problem of obesity in general. At the same time that we have a problem of obesity, we have problems of undernutrition, we have problems of emerging infectious diseases, we have problems of, of violence. The, the world is beset with problems. What the world needs ultimately are public health heroes to address these problems. These problems can be solved it takes a long time to solve these problems, but they're not going to be solved without these kinds of public health heroes, and those public health heroes, I hope, will be you. Thank you very much.